morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are across the known world. And welcome to another amazing interview with The Crown Between Two Roses. Uh, it's very exciting today. I have my co-host, uh, Duchess Eva, and our guests today are Sir Dr. Masadis from Ontier and Master, our very own Master Ianto Van Diemen. Um, I'll pass over to Eva to, to kick off the acknowledgement. Good morning, everybody. So firstly, our traditional acknowledgement of country. Good nobles, we come here together in a spirit of fellowship, deepening of our skills, sharing of our knowledge, and a shared interest in the search to find truth through experimental archaeology and historical inquiry. It is in that context that I, Duchess Eva, on behalf of my kingdom, acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands upon which we gather. We recognize their continuing connection to the land and, cult and culture, and we pay our respects to the elders, past, present, and emerging, and the elders from other communities who may be here watching today. Thank you so much. We're so glad to have you both. And uh, I'll let England kick us off. All right. Um, so we, the theme of today's show is um, about training friends from afar. And I know that you guys have um, been meeting almost daily to, to do some training. But um, so you probably know each other pretty well. But in case the rest of Lockhart don't know you, let's just kick off with uh, how you found the SCA and um, how you got to this point. So Optimus Aries, would you like to start? Sure. Hey, everybody. Thank you guys for having me. It's a real pleasure. Um, I feel very honored to be on your show. Um, I sort of found the SCA <clears throat> right in college. I was taking a fencing class and thought that was pretty cool and then met some folks there that said, well, you should come out and see this demo we're doing. And I went out and uh, there were guys in raggedy armor banging on one another with sticks and and nobody was upset. I'm like, oh, I'm in, let's, let's do this. And uh, got involved with a college group and just, it was such a well-rounded group, a lot of arts and sciences and the fighting community was pretty strong and the college group was great. Uh, my friend Miklos and I uh, joined and doing all the dancing and gaming and getting involved in the barony and uh, just never looked back. That was that was when I was 19 years old, not as young as some, but, but younger than most. And uh, it was a great, great time to be in the SCA and a uh, small little barony down south and yeah. Awesome. You've come a long way since then, and um, so you're you're a knight and a lion of Montier oh. and lots of stuff. Yep, yep. I am. I was um, knighted about ten years after I started, so it wasn't a short road for me, um, but it was definitely a a great road, and uh, I got to travel it with some of my amazing friends and had some amazing mentors along the way. Um, the lion was a complete surprise. I didn't think that I was uh, at that point in my SCA career that that um, folks thought that of me. So that was that was quite a special uh, gift and uh, elevation or award, whatever you want to call it. And uh, I try and live up to that. And, and so that's been kind of the fun of of uh, meeting Helgi at a Sport of Kings and getting turned on to the. Um, online Zoom training that I met um, Yanto and Tully and Loki and a variety of other and and yourselves. You guys have come out a few times and and it's been exciting and challenging and has increased my learning of what we do and and how we do it and it, it's been a real gift. Uh, that's one of the nice things that's come out of COVID. Uh, the getting to meet some of the folks that I would probably not have met otherwise because I would not have been sitting in front of a computer as much or reaching out to try and find some connections, um, folks that were still out there to do, doing our sport. I'm, I'm sure we'll have a lot of questions about that later, so <laughs> we'll, we'll learn more. <laughs> how, how about you, Ianta? How did you find the SCA? Um, it, it was pretty bizarre how I found the SCA. Uh, I was uh, early in my working career, I spent some time in Melbourne, uh, the Barony of Stormhold, uh, and I had a uh, flat, nothing particularly exciting about that. But then a person just left a note on my door saying, you know, can you help me? I, I sort of need some help. 
and it was a gentleman who was living in a deconsecrated church opposite my flat. Uh, he wasn't supposed to be living there and there was no proper bathroom facilities. And so he said, you know, can you let me have a key? I'll pay you some rent. And I did that. And that was very helpful. Uh, struggling young person trying to sort of grow up in Melbourne, having come from Tasmania. And then he uh, sort of said to me one day when I actually met him uh, on, on one afternoon, he sort of said, oh, look, I keep looking in your passion pit because uh, I had all the fantasy posters and all that sort of stuff up on my warm <laughs> bedroom. Uh, and, uh, you know, you know, the kind of thing. Uh, and I also had a suit of chainmail that I had made uh, as part of my interest in uh, role playing games. And he, he then sort of said, look, I, I would appreciate some help from you if you would please uh, put that on, come over to an event uh, at the church uh, and just help out with serving and things like that. And that was, um, I think it was a King, King Henry V society or something. So I had actual linked mail and they had knitted painted silver. And so I was kind of pretty interesting to them. Uh, and then uh, Bevan, who was the gentleman sort of with the uh, sharing the flat with me, as it were, uh, he sort of said, look, their, their king is about to speak. Can you just sort of go up and do something? Uh, so I kind <laughs> of clomped up behind him, drew my sword and stood at guard behind the throne. Uh, and just everybody was blown away. <laughs> I, I, I think fine to me. Uh, and so you know, Bevan was happy. They were happy. Customers were happy. And he said, look, there's another event coming up next week and I'll get you into that one as a participant for free. I'll just talk to the organisers. And that was how I found the SCA. Wow. And they were great to me because I wore all the same stuff. Uh, you know, I had my armour on, I had my weapon girded, as it were, and they just were very polite about telling me I'd kind of broken all sorts of sumptuary rules and all that sort of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> And the, the, they were just great about it. Uh, and so I thought, oh, these guys are good. Oh, this is nice. This is fantastic. And food was good. Uh, the atmosphere was great. The deconsecrated church, an excellent venue. And so we had a wonderful time. And so then I was in amongst Stormhold in the early years. Right, so I'm, I'm not sure if we were in the late 80s or 90s then. I was pretty young. Um, but then I returned to Tasmania without the ability to sort of really... Um, former group. I, I understood how the group worked. People had indoctrinated, indoctrinated me pretty well. Um, it was, uh, we were still a Viscounty at that point. So we had a Viscount, Viscountess of the West. Uh, and I spent some time uh, in Tasmania with no contact with the SCA. And then somebody from Melbourne came down and they rang me up and sort of said, hey, Yanto, where are you? There's an SCA group here now. Get here. <laughs> so I did. Uh, and then I was part of the formation of the Barony of Innes Four. Uh, until then, some years later, I moved here to St. Florian and was part of the formation of the Barony of St. Florian as well. So largely I just signed and, and my membership number counted. It wasn't like I was influential, but I was part of that process. So I've been enjoying it ever since. It's so much fun. Uh, That's very cool. Excellent. So uh, as we've alluded to, we've all been participating in the Tournament of Virtues Pell sessions at some point or another. I have to admit, it's right during the middle of my workday, so I was <laughs> popping in socially and then felt a bit awkward because I was sort of, you know, just ogling from the corner. But one of the things that I think a lot of people have realized is that the known world is actually much smaller than what we maybe were recognizing previously. So can you tell us a little bit about the uh, sort of benefits and challenges of doing remote training with remote training buddies? I mean, I think one of the benefits is you get to reach a larger audience or you get to like for, in my case, you get to make some really amazing friends and you get a chance to um, have people trust you enough to let you teach them over a video camera and a phone. I mean, how crazy is that, right? Yanto's never met me. I still remember the first thing, the first Pell session we had, and we were describing each other's styles and stuff, and he had never met me before. And he's like, well, you strike me as a hitter. And and I, yeah. I thought about that for a minute. I'm like, wow, 
okay, so that's what I'm portraying. And I just took it as, okay, I'm just wailing on my pell. And that's what I, that's what I came out just to break the rust off. I was just hammering the pell and hitting it really hard. And I'm like, okay, well, I need to earn some, some street credit here. So then I, I tried to put my style back in and, and not just go out and beat out my frustrations on my pell and show a little bit of finesse and understanding of what this sport was. But it stuck with me and it's a reminder to always take a step back and and look at what you're doing through somebody else's eyes so trying to figure out how to convey technique over a video camera where you can't alter the way somebody's addressing you in gear or tweak a little thing here or say okay take your foot and let's turn it this way and we really had to learn a whole new vernacular and vocabulary and and learn each other you know figure out how that person walks in their shoes and, and how they react to things and what their capabilities are and are not and and what their style has you know it's not really so much changing a style but helping to elevate a foundation so it's made me i feel like i was a, a pretty okay teacher before i started doing this but between this and some other online stuff it's made me a good trainer i feel i feel like i'm able to look at somebody more so of just looking at them and analyzing their abilities and balance and style to beat them but now from just looking through a camera and you know how you feel when something's just not quite right but you can't put your finger on it i'm feeling i'm a little better able to do that especially now with with yanto and tully i'm forgetting tully's sc name all of a sudden but uh, erlander thank you because I've spent two years, hour a day, just about, except for days when we don't get together, watching them move and hit things and move around and getting to watch them go to tournament. And uh, I feel like I really know. I'm like, okay, so I think you're squeezing your hand here when you do this. And and Yanta will go out and he'll throw it a hundred times and, and, oh, yep this feels this way and we have a good rapport that I wouldn't be able to necessarily do with just anybody I've, I've met because I don't have that that background now that we have. I mean, we've spent hours doing drills and, and giving feedback and he gives great feedback and has a very honest viewpoint of what he sees, which is great. I've learned more during COVID than I had in the previous five to 10 years of fighting on my own because it's really made me look at what we do and, and take it apart so that I can speak it over thousands of miles. <laughs> Absolutely. Your, your point earlier about the vernacular, um, it's been really interesting, like watching the, the SEA coaches corner and um, talking to you guys through the, the Pell sessions that we call things, we have different names for things and it's, it's almost the same, but not quite. And just learning that language um, helps you understand a lot more about what you're doing, what other people are doing, and being able to communicate. And yeah, you know, I think you're absolutely right. You you become a better fighter and a better trainer because you are more open to actually listening to what someone's saying and trying to actually really understand what they're saying rather than um just going, Oh yeah, I know what that means, it's fine. Yeah, yeah, you can't no no assumptions, right? You have to really make sure that somebody is it's your hearing, not just list not just the, the sound, but you're hearing the intent and, and what they're trying to, to get across. And sometimes that's really hard to communicate. Something that I could I could take somebody out and fight them one on one and make them feel what's going on is way easier in person to make somebody feel something and know that they've felt it the right way for them um, is tough over the phone. And I think we've had some there's been, I think, some evenings, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, Ant, or, or add in where, you know, Helgi and I are, are kind of, we're, we're pretty dynamic, and when we will go down a rabbit hole, and, and I'll ask a question, he'll come back, and we have very different styles, and the way we approach learning and um, problems. So the guys, and when we're working with everybody, we, we give a lot of angles and different ways to approach things. And we might just go through one thing and then Ian goes away and practices and practices and comes back and says, well, when I do this, I'm feeling this way. And we're like, oh, turn your heel, you know, three inches. And then he goes out and oh, now all of a sudden it makes sense and, and everything works. But sometimes it's just 
working through it until the everybody's on that same page of intent and um, understanding of the concepts. Sometimes we'll we'll start on a concept and then we go down the rabbit hole and we're like nine layers in that okay you, you can understand the concept but just to get your body and your brain to work together might take some more road building some more foundation building so trying to trying to balance all of that out can be tough <laughs> yeah. sorry i think i went sideways on your question no that was all relevant <laughs> okay. before ianto answers though i have to ask what he means by a hitter because technically we all we're all hitting somebody at some point right <laughs> <laughs> so, as Optimus Artis said, uh, the very first time I saw him approach his pearl, he was trying to sort of knock the rust off and he just went for it. Uh, his movement extremely dynamic and very broad, like big steps, big closing, big angle changes, like, and he hits hard. Like You can see that there's plenty of power generation happening there and it just, it was non-stop. Uh, and I've encountered people who fight me that way. Uh, and you find yourself in this world of, I do want to do something, but they are a hitter. Right? And I've got to wait for them to either gas out, uh, <laughs> hopefully not get me, but you know, as often as not, if they're good, they'll get me before I can really do anything. Uh, and you know, sort of see how you can sustain that storm. I now add to it that Optimus Artis is left-handed uh, and a lot of the angles that he can come in at you are, are ones that you're, you know, I'm particularly unfamiliar with left-handed people. We don't have an active left-handed person in St. Florian's at all. Uh, the, the only people who turn up, uh, Sir Philippe turns up occasionally and is very helpful when he does, uh, but, uh, you know, left-handed. Uh, and so I saw someone who would just take me to pieces. It would be, a, a, over very quickly, uh, but you know, as Optimus Artis was saying, it then you start to realise in the conversations that we had subsequently that there is a lot of expertise behind what he's doing. There is a lot of capability and a lot of understanding, uh, and you know those of us who've had the opportunity to participate in those uh, online pearl sessions get the advantage of his and Helgi's differing views and differing capabilities to actually describe how to do something. Uh, and so it has often been the case for me that I'll be getting the initial description from Helgi about how to do a certain thing. Right? And then I'll get a, a little extra quote from Okta and that will click where I'm struggling right? and then Helgi will build on it again. Uh, and so you get this opportunity to have multiple people participating. And when you know both of you yourselves have participated as well, there is additional commentary that can come in and additional information can come to light. Uh, and so certainly now I, I definitely find myself at the Pell spending quite a lot of time with my eyes shut as I just feel how this move is working, how my body is reacting and then I can ask questions about why does this feel like this? Uh, why is this not feeling right? What can I do that gets that to be more effective? Can I get a better angle with this? Uh, and so you can go from fairly gross um, statements about you know step forward now or step slightly to the left now, which is you know, simplistic, down to, as Okta, Okta said, move your heel slightly at this point. And some of the adjustments that we've made in amongst the various things that we've done have been remarkably small. It's like, turn your toe out now. <laughs> and you go, oh, that's different. I, I, I'm certain that that hit harder when I did that. I'm certain that that angle was different when I did that. And it just, it's an amazing thing to experience. Uh, and each person who's there has an opportunity to contribute. Uh, and and they do. It's, it's certainly very um like it's very welcoming, and I think having being able to have multiple perspectives um, from different people at different skill levels like is really is really useful because everyone's looking at slightly different aspects. If you if you have more experience, you're looking at a different thing to if you're 
um, I've only been fighting for a year, you're, you're looking at a different part of that movement or that person and um, having all of those angles. You don't often have four or five people watching you to give you specific <laughs> feedback. It's like one at a time and they'll tell you something and then three weeks later someone else will tell you something similar and or different or irrelevant and you're just like, ah. But yeah, having a, I think it's, there's a lot of quality in something that you would expect to be such a low quality environment. I mean, like, one, painting in person, right, <laughs> you'd think to be of a higher kind of value than across across video. But because there's so much information there, there is, that raises that value up so much. Yeah. Well, and I think if you haven't had to try and convey, I mean, we can take it as simple as a flat snap. When we're first training and teaching and, 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 you know, Helgi and I both throw very different flat snaps, but to explain it, I have to go all the way to my left big toe is where my flat mm -hmm. snap starts. And I have to understand it, not just a chunk of flow of flat snap or turn your hips. How many times have we have people had that people have told you to use your hips more? You, well, how to use your hips? Where does that generation come from? And to be able to start, okay, here's how my flat snap works. My foot turns power comes up and across my pelvis up through my shoulder and and I'm squeezing and this is what my hand is doing throughout that whole mechanic and okay now how do you throw a flat snap okay mm -hmm. so here are some areas where you're not describing it the way I'm thinking that, that it should be let's try this and this oh so now when you throw your flat snap I want you to squeeze at the end great okay now move your hand three inches through the flat snap now your whole power generate or power finish has changed. Um, we've gotten the snap instead of the push. Um, yeah. So just being able to have to go from being a teacher to, okay, I have to really understand first what I'm doing so that then I can try and piece together the Yanto puzzle in my head of how he's doing it. And I have to understand how, what kind of a learner he is. Does he, mm. is he uh, visual cues? Does he like a lot of instruction? Um, is it something that I need to draw a picture so trying to figure out how the person you're working with learns too, because and, and and understand that as they learn more, that evolution of learning is going to adapt and change, and you got to be able to adapt and and give that person what they need. You, we might deliver it nine different ways. Hell, you might do it away. Erlander might understand it away. I, I might say it away, and then the next week, Yanta goes, "Well, what about this?" I'm like, "Well, that's what I said here. Didn't you didn't you get that?" And he's like, "No, I didn't hear it that way." And I'm like, "Oh." That's my fault. I, I should have found another way to articulate that better or understand what you're doing better. And so I think that, again, being able to do that has made me a better in-person trainer as well. You know, I was working with a guy just last week and I couldn't figure out why his flat snaps looked weird. And then he posted a video and on the video, I got it. I was paying better attention on the video and I'm like, oh, he's doing that. And I wanted to like drive to his house right then and explain it. Right. Because I'm like, oh, I know what you're doing wrong. I know it'll help you out, but it was back to that, you know, I, I was in my armor. I was not picking up on a subtlety from being in front of him to help him. So, mm. you know, it's a constant. Struggle. Yeah. I mean, it, it's interesting as well, because uh, I, I would flip it and say that the opportunities as a, as a student are far greater. You can sort of, get involved and listen to how people teach, especially with a lot of the programs that are available now and reach out to them because uh, like, for example, uh, my night before I was knighted lived in California. So we were sort of doing the remote learning thing before it was cool. But <laughs> that was a tried and tested sort of teaching relationship. And it's the funny thing that happens like as a student, you should empower yourself to listen to as many trainers as you can and get in contact with people and find the people that mesh with your language because every knight or teacher has a slightly different variation of teaching a lot of the same things. And so even as a teacher myself, it's the, okay, this, as Optima Sardis had said, this verbiage didn't work for you, what about this? But we only have so many ways that we will teach that. Um, so absolutely every person should be empowered to go and find the people whose fighting really resonates with them. That way you're giving yourself the best opportunity to learn the style that you want to to follow in and a lot of that 
is through trial and error. And don't quote me, but I think it's a, a Bruce Lee sentiment of, you know, learn from everyone and take what works from you and, and put the rest aside to, you know, keep that in the knowledge bank for when it's useful. Um, and, and obviously, this has been really successful for a lot of us, especially mm. over the pandemic. But even in general, the same sentiments can be carried to our face-to-face -face practices now. Well, yeah, I think I think it's amazing. I mean, I, over the last year, have had to literally tear apart every aspect of my style. I tear, I, my footwork, I took it all the way down. I felt like I had all of my style and learning were in like Duplo blocks, like big, clunky Lego blocks. And I tore it all apart and made it into little tiny Lego pieces, trying to you know, little or smaller chunks of learning so I can reassemble it in more more ways and more options. And it's helped me understand my stuff better. And I, you know, online, I, I would go and do Bronos's Sunday trainings. And you want to talk about break it down and build it back up. I couldn't walk for three days upstairs because my quads hurt so bad after training in a virtual training, you know, in the backyard. But mm -hmm. I think that's important. It's it's everybody needs a foundation. There's a basic foundation of movement and structure and balance and posture that I think are, are for the most part, other than some body styles, different different heights, weights, and that are kind of universal. And once those have been established and you get a good foundation, then adding those tools that you're talking about, you know, I might go and, and learn how somebody throws a Moline. I'm, I fight left-handed predominantly. Me throwing a Moline is ridiculous because it'll get me hit in the neck over and over again. But I should know how one works so I know when I see it. And who knows, maybe the time will arise when I'm fighting another lefty and all of a sudden my brain will go, hey, Moline, oh, I know how to do that because I've thrown it on the pedal doing our number drills, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's important to build that toolbox. But please, everybody start with a strong foundation. Uh, throwing a flat snap with your feet position wrong, your knees pointed the wrong way, your weight transfer wrong. It's injury at the very least, <laughs> you know, and then somebody else will hit you because you're off balance and, and that just creates more problems and then you get frustrated. And so building that foundation, I think is really huge. I'm going to break the format of the show just for a second, but Eva, you mentioned, um, looking for uh, people that you think would resonate or the fighting style that they like and approach them. How do you get over the peer fear or the, the feeling of worthiness to approach someone to say, I want to take your time and use your time for my benefit? Like it's, it's something that I've struggled with my entire fighting career. Um, and I'm sure there's others out there that are feeling the same. So how, how do you just do that? <laughs> so, um, I've never necessarily struggled with the, the peer fear so much as, as you say, like the worry about being a burden on someone else. But I do think that there's a, a level of like healthy humility, which is, you know, not wanting to take their time. And then the, oh, I'm not worthy of, of bothering this awesome person because, you know, essentially I would say that the, the first step is just always to remember that we're all people and most of us are also massive nerds. Uh, and especially for, you know, the knights and, and royal peers, like I, I really do think most people are flattered when people ask and say, hey, I saw you do this really cool thing on a video. Can you talk to me about how you did that? Or, hey, you know, I listened to you talk about this concept and I wanted to ask you some more questions. I can guarantee that most people will absolutely want to hear the sound of their own voice. So as much as it seems like a burden, it's actually like a, a fun and flattering opportunity to be able to, you know, express those ideas or help somebody out. Um, so, I mean, the first step is always to, the hardest step, in fact, is to find where people are, um, which is getting a little bit easier. But, you know, if somebody has an online presence, um, I, I sort of started out in my squire life by being a creep and adding people on Facebook that I knew who they were in the SCA, but they had no idea who I was to the point where the, the first time that I actually met like Duke Fabian face to face, he thought we'd met before. And he was like, it's so good to see you. How you doing? I'm like, I've never met you before, but hi. <laughs> He's like, no, we have. I went, okay, like, this is cool, but also. You know that's fine but you know and and that's the thing is you know don't be afraid to even send somebody like a, a cold message and go hey i'm a squire from x kingdom i saw you do this thing 
um, and I'd really like to ask you this question. And it's more of the, I would say, be direct. You know, I saw you do a thing, I want to know about it, rather than, hey, and then just <laughs> waiting for a response. Um, and, you know, it's, it's absolutely a, if you have the opportunity to travel when we can travel, that's another really good sort of opening to meet people in person, kind of makes it just a tiny bit less confrontational than maybe reaching out online, but you find what works for you. But that's probably to answer the question concisely is don't be afraid. Most people want to help people that take a genuine interest in what they do. Um, so remember that peers are just normal people. We're not really celebrities and we're not really politicians or, you know, anybody who can really ruin your life <laughs> if you offend them in a very minor way. But you probably won't because most people love to be asked questions and they love to teach, especially in the fighting community. I'd really second that 100%. Um, I have not had anybody refuse to tell me something when I asked a question about, you know, so I, I don't understand how that worked or what was it that you were doing there? Uh, and it, it is just magnificent, the uh, level of help that I've received over these last few years. And most of it has just been, I asked a question and what I got was an excellent answer. Uh, I do consider myself extremely lucky in the number of people that I know locally who are very good and who help. Uh, and I also consider myself extremely lucky that I have the ability to travel relatively freely whenever COVID allows uh, and have traveled extensively in the past. It's difficult in Lockhart. It can be expensive in Lockhart, but if there's any opportunity to do so, definitely travel. Uh, and that has given me an opportunity to ask questions of different people. And I'm consistently looking for commonality. Right? As soon as I get recommendations in common across a couple or more people, these are elements to work on. Right? And these are ones that stand you in good stead if you can improve in those areas. Uh, and uh, it, it has been magnificent. And the the, fun, the recent fun story for me is um, the buy fight with Eva. That I, I utterly loved getting totally destroyed. <laughs> uh, but you no, know, it was it was a circumstance where I I was effectively on, on my knees, being repeatedly hit, going, "This is just amazing! How is she powering this consistently?" I probably need to say this is good and stop this, but I need to see this. <laughs> What's I was so on? concerned. <laughs> I was like, what? He's not calling good, but he's also not moving anymore. I should probably stop hitting him. I'm so sorry. <laughs> not until he hits the ground. Not until he hits was, the ground. Right? Yeah. You did exactly the right thing. All that it, was all, it was all me going, this is happening so quickly. These shots are coming perfect angles across this is just magnificent. Uh, and I do need to stop it because that's, you know, the, the first initial rap was actually what killed me. All these headshots are just <laughs> icing on the cake. As far as I need to lie down. <laughs> uh, and, and I mean, I watched the, the replay video. It was how many, what, three seconds, four seconds? For me, yeah. it was a full on minute in my head, I'm going, this is just amazing. Look at this happening. This just, <laughs> yeah. I, Thanks, I, buddy. I, I, keep playing and I, I need to get on a plane and I need to come and be with you guys for a while because mm. they're, they're, Actually, there are definitely yeah. quite different schools and approaches that I've encountered because they're the online resources. You, you stream your training sessions and you watch that and, and the approach is very different from what I encounter in my local group, which mm. is really just open sparring. Uh, and the truth of the matter is I get my breakdown, how to, how to move, where does the foot go, how does it go in greatest detail in these online sessions. Mm. Uh, and then when I get in person with people, it's does this actually work against a person like, you know, so Stefan, who is, so, you know, extremely skilled, but somewhat shorter than I am. Does my reach give me this capability? Right? And then I get to take the same thing out against Leofric, you know, he, who outreaches me 
an enormous amount. Uh, and then I get to try it against people of similar skill levels in the local group and sort of going, you can see these incredible differences around how the skill levels work, how mm -hmm. you can execute things well, but the opponent is definitely aware of how these things work. And you now the whole, this person is not shutting that down, I'm going to exploit that. This person definitely shuts that down, I need to find something else. Uh, but they come from a basis of very detailed descriptions about how to perform a particular move that has been broken down in these online sessions. Uh, and then what you can find yourself with in fight situations is options. Right? And what is the thing that gets to me the most is a lack of familiarity when I have not seen particular uh, techniques consistently used. These are what throw me out. Uh, and and probably the finest example of that recently was Tybalt. Right? His style is absolutely foreign. Right? I had only encountered weird, right? It, uh, <laughs> I had only encountered it once before, weird. which was at the at the um, coronation uh, event for uh, Oz and Miriam, and he had used a couple of techniques there where I'm going that needs to not happen again. <laughs> And in the tournament and the subsequent Rose tournament the, the following day, he didn't use those against me. <laughs> and again, that's interesting. <laughs> He's yep. learned some more things in the intervening time. Uh, and uh, I struggled. I struggled to lay stick on him. And it was, and to me, that's perfection. It's, it's, that's what I need. I need to be exposed to these people who are different. I need to be exposed to different techniques. I need to be exposed to different training capabilities uh, because everything that you encounter like that gives you an opportunity to improve uh, and mm -hmm. that's the journey that's why i'm here uh, it's yeah. all about can i be better tomorrow than i am today uh, and can i keep that going uh, i do have some things where clearly i haven't learned and i do have some things where clearly i have uh, so uh, and all of this is from input. I mean, everybody here today has provided me with input, and there are a lot of other people who have provided effective input in one way or another, and it's all because I'm willing to, and ready to ask. I always ask. Right? The, the person on the other end can say no, and that's fine. That's their choice. Right? But if they say, yes, let me tell you, then you're on a winning streak. It's there, there is nowhere to go but getting better. I always preface that with, okay, yes, I want to give you this information, but I'm now going to go down a rabbit hole. So when it gets too full, if I don't notice that I have, you've got words spilling out of your ears, just say, hold on, Octa, I need a minute because mm. I, I will. I'm always excited to work with people, especially folks. If you come and you ask somebody, that's the only stipulation I would say. If you ask somebody to help you communicate with them but don't be an i knower those are the folks that turn that turn it off that's yeah but, that's or yeah, my, but. <laughs> yes my only my only negative rule with any of my squires was as soon as when, when we're training as soon as the i know comes out then we test that's test time yep and we go into tests i've only had to go into test mode with one squire and then that was quick and we went back to training mode but if you're going to ask for the help be receptive be really asking if you want to come up and say hey i just want to measure against you let's go measure let's let's yeah. mm. have a couple of good bouts if you want to talk about them afterwards that's great but if you come up and ask me to train and i'm going slow to watch you and you're just interested in hitting me in the armpit and the arm and the neck then the, that's not what you've asked me to help you do i'm mm. slowing all myself down to help watch and and train so be in a training mindset when you request that of somebody because nine times out of ten uh, we're excited because if you get better i get better every time i teach i learn something new from the people i'm teaching um but if you're not really wanting to to teach then don't sour that that person by asking them and then being a poor student mm -hmm. mm. uh, uh, Anto brings up a good point before just uh, to cut in Networking is a really huge tool for meeting your heroes as well. Um, so if you're you're not the type of person to reach out directly and go for the source, 
Um, for example, like I first got in contact with Akhtamasades because I was in contact with Sarithin, who's the sister of Mistress Ashaksi, who's the wife of Akhtamasades. And when I was like, I'd really like to fight this guy. I've seen his videos. So cool. We've never met. But she yeah. was like, oh, he does this training thing. You should jump in. I was like, sick. And that <laughs> is a little bit of a softer introduction. And I know that there are other people as well who that's been successful for where, you know, a friend of a friend of somebody, you sort of say, hey, I know that you know this person. Could you give us an introduction is probably a little bit of a, a softer kind of intro. For example, I know like England has ties to like uh, House Segregata in the West. I have ties to House Arendelle. So if it's a, hey, I'd really like to train with X, Y, or Z, you can ask somebody that you know that you're friendly with to vouch for you. Mm -hmm. um, but it's also a case of if you have the opportunity to fight someone that you've wanted to train with, I know we're pretty much stuck where we are for the little first little while, but when you get back out to traveling to wars and events, seek them out and ask for pickups. There is no faster way to gel a teaching learning relationship or even a friendship than to actually have a few passes with somebody. Um, literally beforehand, you might have nothing in common, but as soon as you cross swords, you have that sort of unspoken bond. And I'll, I guarantee that you'll be able to talk to them a lot easier. Yeah. Something, something to be said for sharing the pain, sweat and tears of the fighter community, right? We've all been through it. We've all had to make our armor. We've all had to, to learn to fight and take our licks. And, Mm. Yeah. <laughs> the other thing that I, I often yeah the other thing I often look for when I'm in, in communication with someone and they're trying to to get something across to me is I'm keeping my ears open for a catchphrase because they stick they stick with me and so with Optimus Artists it's the gravity foot uh, and you know the number of times where I've just sort of found myself in a, in a moment that's not fighting related and gone, I'm just stood here, which is my gravity foot? Which is the one that I could transfer power from? Which is the one that I can step away with? Uh, and and that's, that's a really remarkable thing. With Helgi, it's the concept of transitions. Uh, you, there's always a different way to do a transition. Uh, and so you know, against the Pell, I've got a lot of different ways in which I can transition from one thing to another. Uh, and the one I'm always looking for these days is transitioning off a threat of a thrust. Uh, because, you know, people are shutting down my thrust game these days. And that's rightly so. They've realised I can do it. Uh, so now what's the transition from the threat of a thrust? Oh, we should talk about that tomorrow. i got some good ideas for you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yeah. And so, so oh, sorry, come on. No, you go ahead, anyway. I was going to, to throw in another question. So uh, as we're starting to see more face-to-face -face trainings, obviously you can't train by yourself. No one trains in a vacuum. What advice do you have for attracting others to your local trainings? Uh, other fighters or new people? Yeah, I anybody. Mean, new fighters, experienced fighters. I've been trying to, you know, first, the nice thing is we have um, like Facebook groups for our local fight practices. So saying, hey, who's coming out and try and get everybody sparked early so that they're remembering, oh, yeah, there's a fighter practice happening again. And then, you know, we could talk about training. Hey, is anybody working on anything? Anybody want to work on specifics? Um, we have another group um, that I thought I was a part of, but I wasn't that I just got back on. It's a regional practice. And it's like a night's road show. So it's, hey, we're going to pick this event on this or, or this practice on this day. And all these folks are committed to coming to it. So come out. You'll have all of these people that you normally would never see because we're, you know, even though we're only a couple hours away, maybe from each other, we don't always travel that hour south to go to a practice when we have a couple local. So being able to do that and and just get it out there ahead of time and get people's brains back into thinking about regular practices. I mean, before COVID, we had three or four practices a week available here in my local area, and that was all within an hour's drive. So, I mean, just trying to spark people's interests and, and again, work with people. I don't, uh, I can get my practice in and just work with folks and still make it good for me. 
at the same time. So, you know, giving a little bit of that extra. And I'm excited to see people that come back to me and say, hey, I worked on this thing. I'm not going to tell you what it is, but when we fight, I'm going to use it. And then afterwards we could talk I'm like, okay, great. Yeah. Or they'll come up, hey, I'm going to do this with you this time and see how it works. Can you watch and see if I don't do it or when I should be? I'm like, all right, that's cool. And just, you know, putting yourself out there to help help people. I think that that just let them know it's okay. And be, as you go back to practice, and I know we've talked about it on various platforms, be kind to yourself. Be kind to yourself. I, you know, a story for me, I went back, the first practice I went back to, I couldn't get my feet and my hands to work together. Because I had spent so much time tearing stuff apart and trying to put things back together that, oh, great, I did the step I wanted to do. And I got hit in the face because my hands didn't do what they were supposed to do. And it takes a while. You know, even if you've been fighting for a long time, getting all that to fit back in, if you've taken a substantial break or made big changes and only been doing pell work for a while, you know, you get out there with everybody else who's feeling a little clunky or off and nothing's going to feel quite as smooth and right. And the tells and the pickups you normally are used to seeing, you might not yet. And, but but don't don't be hard on yourself. Be happy that you made it out and put your kit on because that's a win right there. Mm, yes, it is. Yeah. So, Deontay, um, going back earlier in the interview, uh, you described Opta as a hitter. Um, mm. What would you have described yourself as when you first started doing these online sessions? And has that changed to what you've described yourself as now? So, so it, it's probably worthwhile noting that, that I do have a fairly, um, uh, I, I don't know, it's not the right word. Hum, humble isn't the right word. Uh, receptive is probably the right word. I, I recognise that I'm in amongst uh, a community of people through good fortune, once again, that is a very high standard. Uh, and so it's fairly easy to approach it, definitely, as the student. Uh, so I, I guess that's probably the, the point that I would make, is I approach this as the student. Uh, and so I have my mind open and receptive as much as I can because somebody is going to give me something valuable here. Uh, and uh, I, I've said to some other people who are trying to learn, listen to everything, right? Pay attention to everything. Uh, and I, I've said earlier, I listen for commonalities particularly, but occasionally I'll put aside points to remember, sort of going, nobody else has said that. I will revisit that at some point. Uh, and frequently in this online world is that I'll get a point that's unusual from someone in an in-person type environment, and I will bring it to these Pell sessions and go, what, what about this point? What, what is it here? You know, is there something that is different? And it, it can be extremely entertaining uh, if you can get Helgi and Optimus Artis to do a full on discussion breakdown and go down that rabbit hole, because then you really learn some stuff. Uh, it can be difficult from my point of view, sometimes to execute this kind of uh, stuff. It, you know, frequently they get into really advanced um, technique, particularly when people start talking about mind and approach. This, this can be something that I, I definitely do not have a complete understanding or capability in the areas that people describe as control. Um, you know, I have had fights with people of much greater skill level than me who will say, I really liked the way you took control then, and then did you notice how I took it back? And I'm sort of going, I, I was just trying to hit you. <laughs> I have no conception of the fact that the control was exchanged during that fight. Uh, um, so Alaric is particularly capable in this area. Uh, and, and he'll sort of say to me, did you notice how I managed to get you that time? And I'm sort of going, uh, no. Nope. And he said, well, I just moved my foot this much at the heel. And in his case, it gives him about sort of um, 20, 30 centimeters more reach. Uh, and, and he gets around you. It's just amazing. Uh, so th there is a lot to learn still, but yeah, approach it. I approach things as the student. Uh, well, 
if I can butt in and totally just jump right on top of you for a second, I would describe Yonto when I first met him as a fighter who knew some combos and would go into the fight, throw technique, not necessarily the correct technique, but he would throw technique and not really understand the why or the where. And Yanto a year later is now deliberate. He deliberately does what, and that's huge. People fighting deliberately, that is the step to be going, going from like a warrior who fights in battles and joins a shield wall to a hero who is, that's their goal is to be a better fighter and to make other people better. And Yanto has taken that step from, okay, I my toolbox used to consist of an onside offside, a leg shot, head shot. I'm going to walk in and then I'm going to throw blows and where they hit the shield and they don't really go around. They don't adjust, adapt to a person that adapts to his opponent and is deliberate in his technique and his understanding of what's being done to him. Even if he doesn't quite understand when it's going to be done to him, he, he gets, he, he gets that. And I wasn't more proud of any students I've had in a while than the first crown that he fought in after we had worked for a year, there might've been tears here and uh, on tier watching him fight and rooting and yelling and coming unhinged off the couch. Um, that was quite a, quite a show. So I would say that he has progressed from that person that learns that rudimentary combos and, and that kind of stuff to really being a student of what we do to the point where I made a canvas to try and help myself with footwork and he made a better one. He's got three half circles in front of his pal and all these lines and diagrams and we go out there and talk about it. And, uh, you know, he was really working on that. So he I did a video even. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Gabs challenged us all to do videos. Who's another one that we go down the rabbit hole with that guy, man. He has some great questions. He does. And they're always loaded, but, but that's how I would describe it. Ian, or Ian, I would describe him of, of going from a fighter who goes out and fights to a fighter that goes out and deliberately interacts with his opponent and listens to the body language and, and is developing quite a quite a good understanding of it that eventually he'll be able to implement more and more. I had a conversation with Leah Frick um, this, this week because uh, during the Rose Tourney in Innis 4, at one point he um, sort of I, I came to him to pick up a rose because I was being sent off a lot, a lot of things. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and he sort of commented on a particular um, feature and I described to him how I had been doing what he was suggesting in the particular fight that I had just finished. Uh, and, you know, I carried on because I was in uh, Tasmania sort of doing other things for quite a few other days, that conversation actually stuck in my head somewhat because, you know, I started to realize perhaps I'd blown him off a bit. That's possibly not appropriate to the sort of now king. Uh, and uh, I started to look through my memory of all the other previous fights. Uh, and I was watching more of the video of them um, earlier today uh, and his, estimate was accurate. Uh, it, it definitely was the case. Uh, and so I had a discussion with him sort of saying, oh, uh, I you know, might have seemed to blow you off a little bit at that point, uh, but you're definitely right. What are we going to do about that? Uh, and so that's, I have something to work on, which does feed into a point that I, I feel is a very significant one is that you do want to have something that you're thinking about working on when you approach particularly a physical uh, in-person uh, session. Um, the majority of St. Florian uh, practice nights are practice nights. They're not really training nights. Uh, and you want to have something in your mind that you're working on. Uh, as Okta has said, sometimes you don't tell the people what you're working on because they will be able to sort of immediately counter it if they know that you're trying to do something. Um, and other times I will state what it is. And I am now in the habit of asking others if there's anything that they are working on, because I, I do feel that we lack a little uh, in the opportunity to drill something in an in-person context. Uh, having drilled so much against the Pell, which has proved to be tremendously valuable, um, there are things that people do that your Pell cannot. <laughs> 
-hmm. and you need somebody to um, go through uh, particular moves and actions to allow you to see you know when when a drill allows them to step a certain way and you have to counter that uh, or allows a, a movement to happen you you need that opportunity to do that in person uh, and it is repetitive and it can be a, a boring uh, but it kind of just dials those things into that point where you can realize that the opportunity is there in an actual combat uh, and you can exploit it in that moment uh, and you know it, I still remember, um, you know, the description of a fight between myself and Felix, where Felix's perception of what happened and he, what he visibly saw was completely different to mine. I, I did not realize consciously in the moment that something was happening, but from his description, he saw a change in my face and in my expression. And particularly he says, my eyes went big. <laughs> I have no recollection of any of that, but moments later, I, I had managed to defeat him. Uh, and, you know, this is what drilling, practicing, and all that sort of thing, you know, you, you realize in a, I know how to do this um, mm -hmm. point of view before you actually click on the brain. But you need opportunities with people where you do click on the brain going, I am thinking about this thing that I'm going to do now. Uh, we have described that, you know, I in a line will approach the person who is the victim at the moment. And I have been instructed to do these moves so that that person has an opportunity to uh, counter, block and uh, respond in a particular way. Uh, and this is valuable uh, and I, I do feel that uh, uh, Gabs's sort of um, household trainings do include quite a bit of that kind of drilling. Uh, but I, th I think possibly part of the problem for St. Florian as a whole is that it has a very, very skilled base. There was uh, sort of the first training session that was available in person after the more serious bouts of COVID. It was myself and five nights. Uh, and Lucky. that's it <laughs> yeah. right but it's fairly difficult to get all of those people to necessarily agree on a structured format <laughs> and it's not that there's any um animosity or any everybody is is very comfortable in each other's company but th there isn't effectively um uh, as you might find in a martial arts there's not there's not the sensei who is effectively in charge of the whole training uh, and our marshal in charge of them because they're official, official events as SCA is concerned is, is usually one of the younger members. Uh, and, you know, they're doing the administrative side of things. Thank you very much, Stephanie, at the moment. Thank you very much, Christopher, the previous <laughs> marshal, who did a great job of it. Uh, and so you do find it's quite tricky. And yeah. it's sparring. It gets sparring. Well, I think I think at that point you, you take it to the individual level. Mm -hmm. You can ask somebody, you know, if they're, if if you feel like they're a student of of what you might be doing hey i'm working on this what are you working on tonight and if you ask that enough next time they show up like oh ian's going to ask me that i better have an answer you know mm -hmm. so what are you working on what's your victory condition here because it shouldn't be winning practice winning practice by hitting by killing me is not necessarily what you need to do right now how about victory condition is you manage to get a diagonal step and get me out of position or you get you don't get your range taken away or you know you block that shot that you don't lose your legs 90 percent of the time there's some there's a there's ways to build your practice to where you get instant gratification you've already shown up so that's one win you put your gear on that's two oh, you're two wins in and you haven't even swung a stick yet so you know watch some mm -hmm. video before you go if there's somebody that's doing a thing send that video to another person that's going to show up and say hey i want to figure out how they're doing this can you help me figure out how to get this position and then you show up at the practice and it's not like it takes your whole practice time when i'm working like if i go out and my first opponent it's slow work i ask them if they would mind and when i'm talking slow work i mean slow work we're mm -hmm. going slow if i'm going to get hit in the face great i get hit in the face i'm not jerking to block all i'm doing is taking inventory of all the scar tissue how my body's moving i transition to okay now i'm going to dance with them how are they moving i don't not worried about hitting i'm just moving my body 
And then the first at speed is the same way. I'm going to approach, I might just be working on um, intent and um, um, pressure. I will move in until I feel that pressure build. And now I'm dancing with them again. So now I'm moving. And that's my first three or four engages are going to be all about that. And then after that, I might try, now I'm going to take control. So the rest of this, you know, this is all happening in five minutes. The next mm -hmm. couple of minutes, I'm controlling the fight. I'm doing it this way. And then I might, oh, okay, they really want to go this way. I'm just going to shut them down. And now they don't get to kill me. And the only way they get to leave is when I'm dead. So we, they're pretty much, they're immortal, right? Because I won't kill them. I'll make them work. And that, or if it's somebody that's better than me, okay, now I've got to find it. I've got to get in. And, I, you know, there's ways to take that five, six minute set with somebody and do nine different victory conditions right inside there and build mm -hmm. it up. And the beautiful thing and what I try and get people to pay attention to is when you're doing that, don't be so focused on what you're doing that you don't, you don't get to read the book. If you go in and you're moving with somebody, how does that affect them? Do they understand that you're moving with them? Do they change because they feel that? When you apply pressure to somebody, how does that affect them? How does it affect you? Do you pick up on the subtleties? Are you get every time you apply pressure, are they just hitting you with a flat snap? You know, and then when you're going after somebody, how does that change? How are you emoting? Are you, I call it, you know, I've had fights where I'm so focused on this one thing, I'm going to destroy my opponent. They stop and they back up because they don't want any of that. And I'm like, I was, it was that, it was on my face, wasn't it? He's like, uh huh. Said, All right. And then, you, <laughs> then you go into gentle bunny. It's okay, little bunny. It's okay. And you, you change that. You don't emote all that out. You leave it inside and it's, I just want to pet your fuzzy tail. Come here. And, and you, you, that affects people. And if you're paying attention, you, you might just go out and fight and try and figure out why they always back up from you. Well, it's because you're trying to hit them with a stick. But if you can make them feel comfortable, and how do you do that? How do you move? There's uh, The practice is more than just you hitting that two-inch opening. It's, it's how that interaction is working with another person and really understanding that that pressure and that mental aspect of the game. That's the, all of this foundational flat snaps and steps. That's the first 10 or 20%. The rest of it's all of that interaction with another person and that mental game and the feeling of how and what's happening. And however you process that, some people are very much not, they don't care what their opponent's going to do. They're just going to emote all over them and dominate. And that's how they're going to fight. I know people that they don't care what their opponent's feeling. I'm very much, I want to know how you're feeling because I want to know how I can exploit that. Am I in your head? Am I sitting? If I can get in there with the lounge chair and my bowl of popcorn and I'll just kick back in the in the easy chair, sweet. You've, you've been beat. As soon as I'm there, the fight's done. I don't have to do anything spectacular except hit you with the right part of my stick. Yeah. If I can't get in there and now I have to apply pressure and I have to let you feel some things at me and, and we work that out. So there's a whole nother level. But if you're so focused and get dialed in at a practice and you don't allow yourself to explore all that, and pay attention. You know, I tell people, if you've hidden your eyes and you count to two, you're dead. Let's just restart. Yeah. But you've lost all of the information on the fight. And I, I, my first 10 years of fighting, round shield, boom, I go full on sombrero and couldn't see anything but people's feet. And I just fought blind and that worked for me. And then I picked up the scutum and I made myself anytime my eyes were covered. I'm dead at a practice. So I made, I want to watch that shot come in because I can then see, oh, there's the wrist, there's the elbow. Oh, look, there's the left big toe. Okay, that's how this, this shot is progressing. So whether you're virtual or not, I think the virtual aspect of that means you have to be a lot more focused and and receptive to what's going on because you don't get all of that touch and 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 that emotion as much. You have to find other things to, to utilize. Mm. but you get to hear this kind of approach you get to hear this kind of detail right and that is the kind of thing that from my point of view i aspire to that understanding right i'm not there not even close right but it is something a person can learn right and you know you just need to see that you know, helgi optimus Ardis, you know gabs leofric Stefan, they have this understanding. A person can achieve this. Right? A person can get there. Right? And that, to me, is the whole thing about that. And it can be an incredible amount of fun to get there. Now, I mean, we, we, ha we have the, 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 the Crown Tournament 
recently was great because it was in the hall. A lot of people commented extremely favorably because they could hear what the people were saying to each other. And for me, listening to the, the videos, that I just laugh. I, I just get into these situations where sort of going, I, I know I have lost and this is a great fight and I did do pretty well, but I'm, I'm defeated and I'm still happy. I can laugh about it. It's magnificent. Uh, you just you know, don't don't feel bad that you have lost. You have had an opportunity to learn something else. Absolutely, uh, fabulous. So we've um, unsurprisingly uh, actually <laughs> gone over our hour. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> so a million questions. Um, so if you guys are able to stay for a little bit longer, um, I'm, I'm good until you guys are done. Good. Yeah, cool. and, um, I know that that our, our tech Magnus in the background is a. Uh, with his little little one, so we'll um, we'll see how how long that goes for. <laughs> but, <laughs> Thanks, Magnus. Yeah. Um, so I've got I've got a question around how you're training virtually and long distance, and it's been alluded to a few times um, throughout conversations. It's very you've got a you're training on your own, even though you're getting feedback. You don't get feedback from an opponent in front of you. So how do you train things like defense and um, strategy where you don't have that person in front of you to defend. Opta? I think that I mean, we cover it in a rudimentary way as far as building that foundation, right? So if we're going to talk about a really basic structure, shield foot forward, we talk about the difference between, I'm very much a proponent of edge out because if you have your shield flat, and all I have to beat is the width of your shield. If you give me two inches and, and one inch to beat, I can do it all day long. If you create edge, now I've got probably 18 inches that I have to beat, plus I have a couple of corners. Yanto laughs at me because the other day we were talking about corner work and scootum work, and I said all eight corners. He's like, yeah. what, do you, what do you mean eight corners? And I thought, well, I guess technically, okay, there's only four, but I block with both sides of every corner. So there's eight. So when you've got that, we talk about controlling that range. So if that's built into your foundation of I've got that edge out, so you not only have to beat my front corner, you have to then beat those 18 inches. And there's a long, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's measured in heartbeats, but it's, it is easier to adjust from there from a strong um, foundation. So we talk about that and we talk about movement mechanics, how just releasing the pressure on a six inch step can change the entire uh, line and range of a fight. So we can work on that stuff on the Pell, but our advantage also was then Ian could go out, Yanto could go out and do practice when he could do practices and videotape them. So then he would come back after fighting with some of these giants of his area. And, and we could say, why are you letting, why are you letting him fight you at range? You know, he's Leofric, he's crafty and he's long and he is like a scorpion and just reach out and pop you. You can't, you can't allow him to dictate that without understanding it. So if you're going to, if you're going to fight at that range, you can't fight at that range. You have to control at that range as you move in and apply pressure to him. And um, so we were able to then go over video, which was really cool. So we could, I mean, we would sit down and take a five minute video and make it 45 minutes as we go through yeah. the video. That's one thing Helgi is really strong at. He picks up yeah, different Helgi. things than I do. I'm always looking for the movement aspect. You know, I watch people walk down the street and, and figure out what shoulder hurts and all oh, that, their hip hurts and oh, they they have, their footfalls are different, you know? So when I watch a video, I'm looking at the mechanic and the intent. I'm like, was that person emotionally involved or, or and did they have their energy in that particular blow or are they being lazy? That's an exploit. If they're just being lazy, that's a tempo change for me. I let them be lazy and then we tempo change. So watch, getting to watch those fights and uh, take from what we worked at as a foundation and then adding some real life. Okay, when that happens, you need to let the foot slide, pick it up with the corner and then re-engage with your Molinet or mm -hmm or just apply the pressure. And now you're in a range that's your B range and it's too close for him to feel comfortable if he's allowed you to get there, boom. Or if you're fighting Stefan, Stefan likes to bring the shield up high a lot of times. Okay, so how can we exploit that? How can you defend against 
the technique that's going to come out of there. This is what he's looking for as an opponent. So we had the advantage of not all being quarantined and not being able to, to fight. We could still, these guys could go out and apply what they learned the week before or the night before. And um, that made it a lot, um, a lot more advantageous, I think, for them as far as being able to apply it. If that makes sense. And another element that I found, uh, which is um, pretty advantageous where you are at your Pell, is the whole use of transitions, where you transition through a defense into another attack. And you can definitely work those when you're working at the Pell. And so you can get a very good understanding of how moving from a, a an engagement, a hit, through a transitional position that gives you a defense and loads you for another shot uh, and particularly this is an area where i've con commented already that helgi is particularly good where he will show you that if you transition into this defensive position particularly if you and the and how the catchphrase is catch a block right? if you catch a block there they've given some momentum to your weapon and you can actually come back differently from what would perhaps be the most um, common shot. And the, the one that sort of immediately springs to mind is where you've cross-blocked. Right? And if you catch a block that throws it this way, you get a chance to then snap from that position rather than offhand, because the offhand is the one that seems the most obvious. But being able to um, transition through what looks like a offhand opportunity into a snap opportunity and these are practicable against the Pell. You can just sort of hit, come to that position, and then work that shot. Uh, and you know, we had these sort of broken down step by step. This is how, this is where, this is how you're loaded. That's how you get the power. Uh, and you've got a timing break in there as well. So they may be trying to look over the front end of this shield. That snap may be an opportunity thing to do. Uh, and so those kinds of defensive through offense is something you can practice against the pill we also did it with the number drill so yeah. the way the number drill work, works i think you guys have been there when we've done that is helgi has a spreadsheet of numbers and they all relate one through eight relates to the pell and then a voice to or a written to speech uh program that calls out three numbers at a time so we would throw in instead of just hitting every number the second number would be a defense a recovery so if you if you throw a number block a number throw a number and so working that into and, and it goes we get it going fast enough for you don't have time to think you just have to react and failure is part of it that's what we try and go to fail because all right so there's your limitation mm. at three second calls hearing the numbers throwing them before the next set of numbers comes out is pretty damn near impossible oh, that's hard work <laughs> <laughs> but it, it trains that lizard brain that back side of the brain to, to hear and, and not think about it, just reacting and it starts to, instead of just ah, spazzing, you start to react with appropriate deliberate things. You have a chance to go, oh, I know what three means. So in a real fight, it would be, oh, I know what two inches of slot means between their defense. Um, or you get that body mechanic, oh, I know what's coming. I'm gonna, as I'm throwing, because I'm paying attention, I'm gonna throw my blow and finish with the block and I'm watching to see where they want me to hit them for the next blow. So training and, and going through the different numbers drills and those are training your ability to react to the, those cues that you're given. And then you absolutely have to have in-person practice to be able to link the feet to the hands, to the mind, and, and now get real, inter real input from your opponent. What does that real input look like? And it depends on the opponent. Some folks, it's gonna be real subtle or it's going to be three moves away and you have to be able to play three moves ahead. Other people, it's going to be, oh, wow, they're letting me hear, they're letting me test for wind, they're letting me adjust my posture. Okay, that, that, that wasn't as challenging. So it's, it's a variety depending on who you're playing with. But so I, I got to say, I, I love that spreadsheets have come into training. Like it just warms the cockles of my nerves. <laughs> <laughs> It's, it's a it's a fantastic training thing i had never done it before and that was probably one of the highlights because by the end of the evening what 800 blows 900 oh, blows? easily 
if yeah. we go if we go through that thing five or six times and you look down and you're sweating from your collar all the way to your waistband because you're throwing all these shots and you're so focused on listening to that voice and you know you have eight opportunities that are coming up and they could be just things you would never do you know like mm -hmm. different combinations because it's just calling numbers you know yeah. thrust to the face wrap to the leg flat snap you know double double over here it's it doesn't feel great but after you do it for a while your body has to figure out how to move to be able to throw that stuff so now you're you're building new pathways you're building new hey i didn't have a way to get from this shot to that shot now i do it's i release the pressure in my right foot six inches turn my heel out and throw everything up into my shoulders and relax and, and so you start to build that stuff and and then the next time you do it you want to find a different path like okay i've done that same technique now how do i do it can i do it before the step during the step after the step so we really explore you don't the flat snap's going to look the same but the when you throw it through your body mechanics could change or the where you throw it and the when changes or you just never throw it and the person reacts and then you hit them in the lake you know so it's what you can elicit when you're when you're in a practice so that that's when it really you, you get to break out the car salesman in person and see what you can sell to your opponent right does my fake have to be this big hand mechanic or can i just give you a squeeze will you squeeze your shield if i just do that because that's all i want you to do is just stop for a minute i don't need you to move i just want you to hold things really tight for just a second um so it is fascinating how differently people react to to faint moves you know i've got some people who you you twitch and they move like they really move <laughs> i use and that others, as a victory condition you know, others you twitch and they don't even notice <laughs> you say, i should have thrown that so, yeah. did they not notice or did they have it blocked see therein lies the rub right are they mm. good enough that oh yeah that wasn't a threat that was just a faint or yeah did they just have no clue that you just hit them in the face without throwing the blow yeah, That's, I have to say that spreadsheet asks the question: Who throws three offside legs in a row? You do. <laughs> <laughs> the good old eight, eight, eight. Oh, see, so that's yeah. Hey, face us for me. Um, <laughs> that would be six, so, six, six for me. So that would be the devil. Yeah. <laughs> T-shaped so pills. You, I'm I'm hundred yeah. percent on T-shaped pills. Definitely get a T-shaped pill. <laughs> So Penny, uh, sorry, Anglin, you should jump in on this question too, but do you all have a favorite training philosophy or motto? I do. I have two. Go for it. I always, every <laughs> class I have, these these are the beginning to the class. So um, beginner's mind. Mm -hmm. Approach everything you do with a beginner's mind. If you already know a thing, you won't learn anything more, but if you, approach it with a beginner's mind you can always learn something somebody always has something to teach you it doesn't matter who they are but if uh, i am very much um, teacher driven i i liked having my night he had a, he has an engineering brain and he can break anything down and he'll ask you to do some weird stuff that you're like i will never ever use that and then you find yourself using it in the fight because you trained it um and then so be, beginner's mind absolutely and then uh for all aspects of what we do believe believe that you can do something behave behave in the fashion and then become the becoming happens because you believe and you behaved in that way so believe behave become those are my two catchphrases <laughs> yeah yeah do you want to go next Re really it, it's very simple there is always something new to learn uh, and I don't use a catchphrase for that, but it's always, you know, what are we going to learn today? Uh, and you may do something that you've done repeatedly before, but something will come out. Yeah. So. I don't, I can't say I really have one, but I think something that goes through my mind when going to training is that it's okay to suck. Mm -hmm. And like, that's just so you don't get caught up on the failures and you use them as a a learning experience rather than a, a muffling experience so yeah how about you Eva? yeah absolutely. um i think one of my favorite ones is 
discipline carries me when motivation is lacking. Um, I think I watched an interview with Uther or had a conversation with Duke Uther where he said, you know, I wasn't naturally gifted as a fighter in the beginning. I was naturally gifted at getting my ass in the car and going to training. And honestly, that for a lot of people, that's usually like the biggest setback is just taking that first step to getting there. And once you're there, it's it's great. But, you know, that's that's it. Just be disciplined, get to training. You'll get the benefit from there. Yeah. That's huge. Mm. I'll readily admit that I am not a great person at physical activities. Uh, it, it has always been a struggle through my life to do any physical activity well. Uh, but coming into the fighting with that mind of get in amongst it and give it a decent go. And I mean, this, this process certainly recently for me, you know, the reauthorization after a long break uh, and taking it seriously, getting involved, the commitment I have, I will fight every crown tournament I can possibly physically get to that COVID doesn't stop me. I will absolutely do it. Uh, and you know, I, I would like to win one. I don't, make no bones about it. I would like to win one. Uh, will it happen? I'm going to keep trying. You know, it, it, there's no reason to stop. Uh, and it continues to be fun. The journey continues to be fun. Uh, and I'm surrounded by people who continue to make it an enjoyable experience to be a part of. Uh, you know, bruises and, and beatings notwithstanding, <laughs> you, you can get over those. You know, the good old heroid cream, let us, let us praise that uh, wonderful substance. Um, it, it, it's just under community. Now that whole thing, there is definitely a group of people who are more than happy to continue to fight with you, to continue to teach you and to continue to participate all over this uh, wonderful society. I, I really look forward to the opportunity to um, get to see Optimus Artists, to get to see how we, I, I certainly hope I can do that. Uh, and, uh, you know, that they'll take me to pieces. They will when we fight. They absolutely will. No. First shot's going to be a butt wrap for the whole yep. truck there. <laughs> yep. I am a big lover of the animals, and I keep teasing Anto about everything in Australia wanting to eat you. Mm -hmm. And he had, me going, bears, right? he had me going on drop bears <laughs> to the point where I was Googling a drop bear, and then I finally figured out he was pulling my leg. So... <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah, 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 yeah. So my new shield behind me, the golden lion, will have a drop bear tear. <laughs> yeah. so I had a little chuckle a second ago, and it's because there's a, a question that's come in uh, for Ianto specifically. Who would you like to beat in a crown final? Crown final, and why is it Cormac? <laughs> 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 Cormac and I have this sort of relationship that we consistently um, approach the Crown Tournaments, we consistently enter, uh, and he has a habit of always trying to challenge a fellow Laurel. Uh, and, and he made the trash talking video and it, it was magnificent, absolutely magnificent, just so much humour involved in that, that it was just a wonderful thing to see. And so I, I look to him to be the trash talker, and I hope that I can be the person who just shows through the practice and experience that I am improving and that he will have a harder and harder fight on his hand as time goes by. Uh, but it's just part of the fun. It is part of what it is. But if I were to say who would I like to, to meet and to defeat, uh, there was a side of me that would have liked to have taken Leofric out in this recent one. That would have been something to, to take home. Uh, and I kept telling myself, and uh, we have it on video, uh, that in a recent uh, Practice in the Park session with him, it was um, victory to me, victory to me, double kill, and then he defeated me. Uh, and so that's a crown final where... Leah Frick is defeated. I can do it. I can do it. Uh, and that's what I have to take every time I go. This recent crown tournament, 
my particular result was not magnificent. I'm sorry to all those people that I might have disappointed. Right? But in the field that I was uh, involved with, that that was, you know, it was only seven people, but what a group of seven people. I, I felt that I fought good fights throughout that tournament. Uh, I think that the practice and experience showed, but on the day, in the moment, I was defeated. That's the way it is. I'm going again. I'm not going to stop. That was an intense list. Yeah. I think I think the answer to that question that I think most of us would probably say, who would you like to meet and beat in a crown final? Anybody. If I'm in the <laughs> crown final, I don't care who it is. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not going to pick and choose. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody just pay, the, pay for the ride. <laughs> but I mean, the, the, the previous crown, I had no idea when I faced Angus that I was fighting for the finals. I did not know. I was just taking each fight as it came. Uh, and, you know, I was sort of going, you know, he's, I've encountered him before. He's been a bit of a bugbear for me because he's pretty bloody good. Uh, and uh, I felt once again defeated, but a good fight. You know, something happened that put me off my game slightly in the midst of it. And he was already throwing the shot that was going to kill me no matter what I did. Right, and you can see it. Right. So, and you go and that happens. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, now, uh, I will have to shoot off shortly, uh, but I wanted to close out on a bit of a fun question since we've been doing a lot of heavy training mentality stuff. <laughs> What's your favorite no shit there I was war story? Oh, and this will be goodness. fun because we've got an out of kingdom character. So. <laughs> Back in the early days, when I was squired to the first um, chivalry that I was squired to, Master Timothy, we had driven, and for those, so I live in um, Washington, I lived in um, Eugene, Oregon, which is pretty much West Coast, and we had driven to Australia War, which is a good, that's Arizona, uh, it, was a, it was a long drive, and we drove straight through the squires and, and Master Tim, and uh, we get there, we get all set up. Our friends are king and queen. We're, we're taking care of them. We go out for the first battle. I'm a small town kid. I'd never been to anything bigger than maybe a, a West War, which you get a few hundred people on a side, and now you're in Australia with a few thousand on a side. And Tim's this big lumberjack of a guy, giant round shield, lefty, because he injured himself, so it was a great mentor for me. And we, we're, we're milling about. We're waiting to go, waiting to go, waiting to go. And all of a sudden, the Leons are called, and here we're going. And we're all excited, you know, I'm 20, whatever, just all full of piss and vinegar. And we're running and we hit the wall. And the first thing Tim does is just cut the dude in front of him in half. The guy falls. I trip over him and get piped in the back of the head. <laughs> <laughs> That's like my big welcome to war. Go sit down mm -hmm. for 20 minutes while the next fight happens. <laughs> so That's kind of the comical Comical no shit there I was story, but yeah, good times. Well, that's, you got that, one, Ian? Yeah, that's fascinating because mine has has a similar outcome. <laughs> uh, um, at my very first Rowany Festival, I was actually authorised on the spot as a javelinier. Uh, and when it came to field battles, I was uh, assigned to the uh, little hit pack that contained, um, was he Sir Brucey at the time? I think he was. I'm not sure. It was a long time ago. Uh, and uh, we were to sort of try to get onto a flank, sort of move around behind everything and try to get onto a flank. And I was like, that sounds great. So Leon was called. Uh, we started moving and I was shot absolutely perfectly across the entire field at least. <laughs> 50 to 75 meters, and the shot was a perfect shot to my heart. Absolutely <laughs> perfect. Uh, and so I fell down, lay down, and enjoyed a wonderful viewing position to watch the unit I was supposed to be moving with get onto a flank and munch it. It nice. was wonderful. So I'm sort of going, how successful was my unit? <laughs> my other... <laughs> My other favorite evil lefty war story is, uh, I forget, it might have been an acorn war, a little smaller war, but
but it was they were starting off with a fun battle so it was chivalry versus the world and as you do you kind of wander onto the war field and kind of decide where you want to be and as a lefty i kind of like to be on on the left side because people don't know what hits them when that sword comes from the wrong angle and we're milling about waiting and i look over and oh there's another one of my friends who's a knight who's a lefty oh look there's another lefty we had about 15 left-handed fighters in this shield wall wow and we would hit the lay on, lay on we would hit these lines and just decimate them and you could watch our progress across the field there would be a line of dead unbelts and one lefty knight a dot line of dead unbelts and one lefty knight we just literally marched across the field with our evilness and slayed them all from the wrong side of the of the hand there it was it was that was pretty <laughs> epic and fun the looks on their faces were great <laughs> i know something you don't know <laughs> yeah. they're, they're fighting many... backwards yeah. <laughs> how many times can you get away with that before they cotton on to <laughs> what's going on well the, the funny thing is i'm not left-handed i'm right-handed i changed to fighting left-handed due to a repetitive injury in high school throwing javelin so when I came out to fight heavy, um, every time I would miss a wrap or something in my use and I would try and stop it, my shoulder goes rip, rip. And then I'd have to take a month off here, a month off there because I was still young and healed pretty quick. And so Master Tim, who was also came off injuries and was naturally right handed, had learned to fight left handed. I finally said, look, can you just help me? I, I need to switch. I need to, I need to, if I'm going to keep doing this and I want to keep doing this, I need to switch. So I learned to fight left-handed. So that's, and now the shoulder is pretty good as long as I don't do any stupid stuff. And this poor guy came out to us. We have Squires tournaments here. I don't know if you guys have anything like that, but at our crowns, the day that's not crown is a Squires tournament. So all the Squires, or if you're not a Squire to anybody, you can ask a knight. We were talking about going up and putting yourself out there. You can ask a knight to be Squire for the day, and people will sponsor you. And all the Squires go out in a big circle, and they, they announce themselves. They announce who they're fighting for, who they're Squire to. It's a really awesome thing. And this guy comes up to me about halfway through the day and challenges me. I'm like, sweet, because the knights will go out and mingle, because we're not keeping track. We're just out there to have fun and, and help and train and teach. And he looks at me and, and I, I set up and he's like, oh, another lefty. And, and, and out of the kindness of my heart, I'm like, oh, wait a minute. And I swapped to my right hand. Well, right hand never gets to hit anything. Right hand got really excited. And I wrapped it right in the back of the neck. Poor guy's gorget explodes. And I'm feeling just I'm feeling horrible. <laughs> like, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I think he thought he was going to get an easier fight. And the, the right hand just said, screw you. We don't get to hit things and, and uh, it got a bit excited so he did come back later and say yeah i should have been wearing the new crochet that i that i made that old one that old leather one was a crappy old I'm like okay thanks but, but how anyways. impressive is it when you hit the armor off of somebody honestly <laughs> it's almost as fun as, as he, hearing that, that little squealing sound you know when they decided to squeal instead of puke you know my squire brothers and i did <laughs> I swear, I'd rather all when it was every, every time he hit me in the armpit, it was all right. Do I throw up or squeal? Honor him with the walk, you know. You take that walk around the practice <laughs> area, going. Mm. Eventually, the feeling's going to come back in that butt cheek, and yeah. So yeah. Awesome. <laughs> all well, in good you, fun. Thank you guys for joining us today. Um, it, I still have a million questions, but conveniently, I've got a forum to ask them in. So <laughs> that's great. Um, thank you both it was it was really wonderful hearing the insights and experiences um through that virtual training and i think that a lot of people will get benefit on on what they can do um remotely or or yeah all different things so thanks for that um yes. next week we have uh peerage progeny so we're going to talk to two second generation peers um, mm. about their experiences in the sca so join us for that um is there anything else you'd like to bring up before we finish up no well, i just like to say thank you what a pleasure uh, you guys are fantastic i hope to someday get to travel to lockhock and meet you all and hit you with sticks and be hit by sticks and and i, I would just like to say in this forum to thank you to yanto because i mean what an amazing amount of trust to give somebody you've never met in person the opportunity to guide you or adjust things and and work with you i mean that's huge 
there's people I've known for a long time that I don't have the same level of trust with. So I appreciate him putting himself out there and all the stuff he's taught me over the last couple of years. Well, I'd certainly like to echo the thanks for the opportunity to be here today and particular thanks to Helby and Okta for continually coming out and offering the advice and continuing to help me to improve. Um, Erlander and his enthusiasm has helped me a lot. The um, presence of other people who pop in occasionally as well. There has been a useful advice and useful questions. Questions can lead to thoughts, <laughs> which can lead to opportunity. So the, these are all advantageous things. So uh, no, please, yeah, thanks. Continue. Let, yeah. let, let it more. Uh, I still take uh, whenever I'm working from home uh, the break because I have flexible working hours. I take the break to have the time to do something on the Pell. Please, weather <laughs> is not going to, but uh, yeah, let's continue. And please, if there's anybody else out there, participate. It's it's open, it's available. We, we're definitely happy to see other people. I, I pay attention when I see other people being trained, right? because it can gel for you what it is that you do know, it can show you subtleties that you may not have managed to incorporate, or it may be something that you haven't realized or that you know, they've asked a question, which is you, know, you desperately want to know the answer to that question, but you didn't think to ask it. So, you know, come join us, ask some good questions. There will be good answers. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you again so much for joining us. You've been amazing. Thank you, Penny, as well. Oh, hang on. I'm so sorry. <laughs> and uh, we'll see everybody again next week. All right. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it. See you later. Oh, and thanks, Magnus. <laughs>